Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. President, Fine Organizing Committee, Dr. Jagasi, Dr. Anad Takur, and others, thank you, and I am deeply honored to be here today. I must say that I uh, just arrived. We had over one meter of snow in Salt Lake City yesterday and stopped no nothing, but we had one centimeter of snow in Amsterdam and it stopped everything. So I'm happy to be here and I'm very pleased with this honor and I hope that I might do the Delacchia family the honor uh, that uh, I feel in endowed to, to provide today. So I'd like to present what I know about Professor Delacchia, recognizing that there are people in this room who know him personally and know his legacy far better than I do. Of course, he's well known as a pioneer in the uh, uh, introduction of many, many orthopedic academic techniques and surgical techniques to India. He is recognized worldwide, and uh, I will try to go through some of this history. P Professor Delacchia was uh, president of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, of the Associations of Surgery of India, of Saikot, and of several prominent Indian orthopedic societies. He is also well known for presenting many international lectures all over the world, including uh, China, Russia, UK, and many uh, invited orations, and was awarded the 20th Ramesh Rameshwaras Birla National Award for Outstanding Clinical Practice in 2003 most recently. What is most impressive to me about Professor Delakia is the Padma Shri Award. It's the fourth highest civilian award in India. Fantastic award to recognize public service and service in the public good, in which he won in 1973. What's also impressive is that he won the Perkine Medal from the Czech Medical Association, and this is the same Perkine who was the founder of the Perkinji fiber, the nerve fibers that are named after him in the Czech, uh, in the Czech Republic. So this honorary medal for meritorious achievement in orthopedics was provided in 1988. He's also noted here in India for establishing well-known and world-leading orthopedic departments in clinical service in various local hospitals and national hospitals in India. And I feel proud to be able to bear this honor on his behalf. So let me start my talk. In the United States, I'm forced to produce a interest disclosure, either real or perceived. I have financial interests in some small companies that are trying to make antimicrobial bone products that are licensed from my university. I'm also a consultant for Depuy Synthes uh, Biomaterials, and I am also a consultant for the AO Foundation. So the topic I'd like to talk about today is infection. And what's interesting about infection is I get two classic responses as a PhD. In the United States, if I talk to orthopedic surgeons, I've never met a surgeon yet who's had an infection. If I group surgeons in a room, say I gather four orthopedic surgeons in a room, I'll get seven opinions about infection. And yet, my colleagues at the AO Foundation and myself believe that infection remains one of the most unsolved orthopedic challenges currently of the century. So the question is then, in implants, 95% of patients that we implant with certain expectations for improving their quality of life, in fact, experience very few difficulties, very few problems with pain, and they get functional restoration as successful endpoints. So we can be very proud of the job that surgeons provide in this regard. The biggest problem is with implant failures where 5% of implanted patients experience severe adverse events. So in my country alone, we have over 100,000 device infections per year, costing $10, $10 billion in direct costs and an estimated $100 billion in total costs, including cost of work and cost of life. So the question is, uh, what do we do about most adverse implant events? And that we would posit that most implant events are associated with implant-associated infections. So that, to a large degree, this 5% of dissatisfaction or adverse event uh, response to implants is associated with infection. And the problem gets worse if we think about now the rising number of primary surgeries for total hip and total knee arthroplasty shown here, total hips projected from 2005 until 2030, 
has a rather linear uh, escalation, but total knee arthroplasties, in fact, have an exponential uh, incidence in implantation. And if we consider then that the inf infection rate might remain constant at a conservative 1%, with a total knee implantation of exponential growth, that the infection numbers, while they may remain constant rate, that the number of infections will certainly increase. And if we move to revision surgeries, total knees then are going to be revised at an exponential rate simply because the primary implants are going up. And the infection rates are going to now uh, stay at a well-known 8 to 15 percent because some uh, revi revisions never resolve their infection. So the problem is then a greater challenge because the overall number of infected implants is increasing. The age demographics, that is younger persons as we heard this morning uh, from Wilson's talk and developing countries are now implanting increasing numbers of total hip and total knee arthroplasties. And so even if we forecast an infection rate then uh, that's constant for primaries and is increased fivefold for secondary revised surgeries, there will still be then an increasing problem with infection. And in my country alone, we forecast 50,000 deaths annually from device-related infections. The other problematic point was also mentioned this morning is that the cost of revisions and the cost of remediations is also five times that of primary implant placement. So if we think of one-stage revisions and two-stage revisions, increasingly one-stage revisions are now popular to consider in countries like Germany, for example, Two-stage revisions are common in my country, and yet the cost of doing these in, uh, revisions is, is incredibly high. So combined with the increasing incidence and the increasing cost, I would argue that infection remains a daunting challenge both for my country and for countries around the world. The other interesting fact comes from Freiburg, from Norbert Sukumps uh, AO group there, and a recent survey showed that patient quality of life is substantially reduced after a total knee or total hip arthroplasty prosthetic infection. Even if that infection is resolved, the quality of life indicators go down for these patients. So clearly there then there's a morale and an attitudinal problem even with patients that resolve their prosthetic infections. All right, so let me take you back to basics then. I understand that you're clinical researchers and clinicians at heart. I'm a basic researcher and I'm a PhD. So let me try to then meet you in the middle today with this lecture. The steps to implant infection then involve the primary point, which is contamination. And I'll get to this in just a moment. That is where bacteria then can find and colonize a tissue or a device surface. This involves then a critical step called bacterial adhesion and adhesion then promotes a growth step so that while planktonic swimming bacteria can grow, these are non-threatening generally to humans. It's the adhered bacteria that remain the threat for subsequent infection. So the contamination, adhesion, and colonization are what we call then test tube events. These are events that we can easily duplicate in the laboratory. And the last then uh, following these three necessary steps, the last step is infection and infection. Infection only occurs in the presence of a host. You cannot duplicate infection in a test tube. And if that's the most important lesson you can take home today, that's very critical. So that the host is very important to integrating what we can do in the laboratory, that is expose bacteria to biomaterials, and the host response then determines how this then results in infection in a living, in a living organism. The second principle is this concept of biofilms. And the biofilm then is a polymicrobial uh, bacterial growth found adherent to a uh, implant surface. Oftentimes though, these microbes are not culturable. So that standard microbiology techniques used in classic clinical microbiology labs and in the hospitals oftentimes don't culture all the organisms that are harvested from an infective implant. And the other distinguishing feature of biofilms is that these pathogens that are cultured on implants are coated with what's called slime or a thick polysaccharide goo that is a very effective defensive posture for these bacteria on surfaces and distinguishes their phenotype from what is found swimming in the body. So the second take home lesson is that planktonic bacteria are rapidly and readily cleared by our immune system, but that adherent colonized bacteria, particularly those coated with slime, are very intractable to clearance 
by our immune system. So biofilms represent then the chief hazard in looking at implants, how they infect, and how that infection persists. The second point is, well, how do they get there? And there is this enigmatic and I think false uh, claim in so many surgical suites around the world that surgical suites are sterile, when in fact we know that surgical suites are far from sterile. Thirty percent of instrumentation is often contaminated in any operating room. In, in uh, an American hospital, surgical suite doors can open up to 60 times during a total hip arthroplasty for non-essential reasons. Nurses coming in and out, scrub nurses coming in and out. Uh, technical staff, surgical staff, radiologists, anesthesiologists entering and leaving the room. So that the operating suite is not sterile. In fact, I have been involved with studies where we actually culture live organisms from the handles of lights, from the keyboards of the anesthesia uh, equipment, from trays and uh, things within the sterile field, from the wheels of the operating table, and from many of the instruments in the room. So that none of the operating rooms are sterile. The patients and the surgical staff are often not sterile either, despite scrubbing, that there's bacterial and fungal sources from the dust that they bring in the room, from the skin that they shed in the room, from the respiratory particles emitted from their lungs during breathing, from their hair and their clothing. The estimated bacterial seeding, therefore, in a standard operating theater in an open uh, classic aseptic field has been estimated to be about 270 bacteria per square centimeter of wound surface, and that's from my colleagues in Groningen in the Netherlands. And these 270 bacteria, any one of them, any one of them can cause a surgical infection. And then there's another study that looks at surgical trays and the contamination rates at one hour, at two hours, at three hours, and at four hours, and it's clearly seen that even the surgical trays get contaminated in the sterile field in the operating theater. And if you're interested then, there's a, a recent recent study, because this is not a uh, new topic, but in fact new data continues to validate the idea that bacterial colonization occurs in the modern operating suite. So there's the source of infection from the surgeon, from the patient's skin, from the air, and from the uh, components in the operating theater, and any one of those bacteria can move on to cause infection. All right, so point number four is that in vivo studies demonstrate that bacteria numbers are reduced to produce an infection in the presence of a foreign body versus the absence of a foreign body. So let me explain to you. There is then this minimum infectious dose in colony forming units in the absence of a foreign body and in the presence of a foreign body. And what we see with various studies in almost 40 years now of work is that in different types of hosts, in different types of implants, that the numbers of bacteria necessary to produce an infection in the presence of an implant are far reduced compared to an infection in the absence of an implant, oftentimes orders of magnitude. And so the, the idea is that implant presence alone reduces the host defense against infection, and that the pathogen dosing required to produce an infection in the presence of an implant is two to three log orders, shown here, lower to produce an infection. That means that the presence of the implant alone predisposes the patient to infection, regardless of their immune status, and that any one inoculum, here we have only 300 CFUs necessary to produce an infection in humans. And here's the original study from 1957 that showed that virulence enhancement of the order of at least 10,000 times in the presence of a foreign body, in this case is they're using staphylococcus in the presence of sutures, and they used human volunteers, and what's puzzling here is that this experiment convincingly demonstrated the enhancing effect of stitches, of sutures, but led to great difficulty in finding further volunteers. This was a conscripted study using medical students in 1957, which would, of course, never be allowed in my hospital now under IRB approval laws. All right, so that the host foreign body response compromises the clearance of organisms from the wound site so that host immune competence has to be somehow correlated with the presence of an implant. So here we have now pathogen introduction in the operating suite and now host compromised immune response to clear it. And here's a picture from a study that I did with my colleague Ken Ward at Portland, Oregon, where we took a polytetrafluoroethylene device, that's Teflon, we implanted it in the abdomen of a rabbit, and after uh, three weeks, this Teflon implant develops what's called the dense foreign body capsule, 
some of which we saw in surgical uh, uh, encapsulation studies this morning by video, this dense fibrotic tissue has no vascular supply. So essentially, inside this capsule is a hypoxic environment that's perfect for growing bacteria that are um, anaerobes. And here's then the connective tissue outside in the normal wound site that contains vascular components, competent immune system, but is walled off from the implant by this avascular shield. So this foreign body response then produces an enormous amount of problems. Here's another example of this dense fiber sheath on an encapsulated electrode that was also in the omentum of a rabbit, just to display how, how impermeable this barrier is so that the host foreign body response produces delayed healing, unfinished healing, exacerbated inflammation, and delayed tissue integration. It disrupts the perfusion of the vasculature. It disrupts the transport of immune cells, like macrophages and neutrophils, that are necessary to kill bacteria against the implant. There are surface issues where bacteria can colonize, and once they adhere to a surface, they are very difficult to cleanse using our immune cells. So that this device encapsulation as part of the foreign body response is a daunting and related problem to how infection propagates on implants. And the last scientific component is very interesting. We've discovered that macrophages, the most potent immune leukocyte cell capable of clearing pathogens, that they're actually capable of being infected by bacteria that then will, in the presence of the living macrophage, inside the macrophage in these lysosomal vesicles that Staph aureus can actually replicate and duplicate and be carried around inside these living macrophages so that macrophages intended to clear infection in our body actually are spreading infection by carrying living bacteria within them and moving about the wound site and even penetrating the blood-brain barrier because they can and carrying staph into compartments and tissue beds in the human body where they're not supposed to be. So that this intracellular niche for microbes is an increasing hypothesis for how infections can propagate even in the presence of antibiotics because of course these macrophages will keep antibiotics out and they provide a safe haven for microbes to populate within. So the question we ask more and more is, why don't we see more innovation in biomaterials? Why don't we see innovations that lead to more antimicrobial technologies and more antimicrobial devices being commercialized? And that's a compelling issue. And I think that India has an important role to play that I'll bring this home in my end closing message. And of course, it's complicated. The answer for why we do not have new devices is in fact quite complex, and let me try to take you through the complexity. So what are the barriers to translating new technologies into antimicrobial devices that surgeons can use for the benefit of patient's quality of life? So the first one I'd like to talk about is infection research translation problems. I just introduced to you the principles of how implants get infected and how difficult they are to clear once they become infected. Let's look at some of these things. So here's how we teach in my bioengineering program, which is a world-leading, pioneering bioengineering program in the United States, how we teach about what is an innovative biomaterial. Well, typically, this is what a PhD student or an MD PhD student does for their doctoral thesis in my group. They have a hypothesis-driven objectives. The end users for this project are usually scientists, the scientists on their committee, the scientists that want to read about a new biomaterial in a journal. The biomaterial is chemically and physically defined. It could be very complex, but nonetheless, we can define what it is. The performance improvements are usually done in a test tube in vitro or in simple clinical models like a mouse. They have arbitrary metrics and they're non-standard. That is, let the student publish new results, and that's all that we demand. We ask then in a new biomaterial that has unique properties, it has innovative value, but the impact metric is really not in the patient. For a biomaterial to be innovative for a PhD, the impact metric is really just publishable novelty, innovative properties, get that person out into industry and allow them to make new products for patients. So this is basic and applied research. If we think about a clinical biomaterial, one that you can use, one that you will see in a commercial product, one that you can see in the vendor stands out in the hallway here at this meeting or at the AAOS or at the uh, academy meetings, 
Here we have hypothesis-driven objectives that are the same. But now the end users are not scientists or PhDs, they're patients and they're physicians who need to use this biomaterial. And as a result then, this now distinguishes the path of the biomaterial from the basic science study. It has to be a very safe and effective, very simple chemical composition. That's why low density and high density polyethylene are very common materials because they are very simple. Stainless steel is a simple material. Cobalt chrome is a simple material. And so many of the super fantastic biomaterials that we see, as I see as editor of the Journal of Biomaterials, here I will never see in the clinic. They have to be simple for a physician to use. They have to be manufacturable under GMP conditions as mandated by our FDA. They have to be cost effective. They have to have intellectual property so that an investor, a company, will want to come and make them. They have to have a clear path for regulatory approval, which is not present in this pathway. It has to be reimbursed by the insurance companies, and it has to have an impact metric, which is clinical practice and patient-driven quality. So this is translational research, distinguished in its simplicity and its purity and its clarity for the surgical use from the more complex and applied research. And as a result, we know that 99% of basic research done here will never see your hands. It will never see clinical use. It will never be commercialized in a form that has regulatory approval that moves it into clinical use because it's too complicated, too costly, and, and uh, has many other limitations. All right, so now, what's the problem? So Tony Gristina was a mentor of mine in the 1980s, and he coined what was called the microbial race for the surface. The race for the surface was the ability of bacteria to reach an implant surface in vivo in the patient and to colonize and to create an infection nidus on this surface much faster than our own tissue host cells could colonize that surface. So the race was between the human healing response and the bacterial infection response. And the race for the surface has come back up recently in a science translational medicine paper that we published last year, reinvestigating what has happened with this idea of creating biomaterials where the race for the surface favored tissue integration and disfavored infection. So one of the ultimate, then, new things in biomaterials and bioengineering is to create what's called tissue-engineered products. And some of you might know the Genzyme product Card cardicel, in which then cartilage is harvested from a patient in an autologous way, is expanded ex vivo, and that autologous expansion of chondrocytes is then put back into osteoarthritic knees. And this project costs about $40,000 per patient. So it's, of course, a boutique strategy, but it represents this idea of taking self and using self to regenerate self. And of course, another popular product is, is uh, living dermal skin with competent dermal fibroblasts that are cultured from autologous and heterologous sources now and used in living skin dermal replacements. So these are tissue engineered products. So if we're going to talk about the race for the surface, the race for the surface could be easily accomplished using host cells that are living, competent, and to pre-colonize implants with living cells. So we pre-seed host cells onto implants and a tissue engineering strategy. And the question is, does it change the race for the surface? Because we're biasing the outcome by using living cells already resident on the implants, taking that living construct and putting it in to the human host and asking it to heal. So we have done the largest study, the only powered statistical study that looks at this hypothesis, where we took 228 GMP prepared uh, polyester implants that look like this for subchondral knee replacement where this spongy porous textured surface was then seeded with autologous chondrocytes and then implanted into subchondral bones in, in the effort to try to mitigate uh, chondrocyte degeneration in the context of osteoarthritis. These were human implants prepared under GMP condition already received the CE mark in Europe by this company Isotis in the Netherlands. They were seeded and incubated with autologous chondrocytes, and they were then in contralateral knees, then the living construct with the living chondrocytes was placed into one subchondral compartment, and then the opposite knee, the non-living, naked construct was placed in the other one. And the question was, is the infection rate different? Did we chase 
the race for the surface? Did we change the outcome for the race for the surface? And the disappointing result was for 228, this is an immense amount of work, was that with no cells seeded, just the naked implant, that the infection rate shown as the white bar in each of these cohorts is exactly the same size as the white bar in the tissue engineered system. That is, the infection rates were statistically insignificant in a statistically powered study. And so that they, because the infection rates were completely similar, the seeded surfaces provided no advantage over the race for the surface against infection than the bare surface alone. And that was an immense disappointment for us. So the conclusion was that tissue engineered orthopedic devices also infect. We can put the patient's cells on them, but in fact, these living autologous chondrocyte seeded subchondral knee grafts infect at similar rates as the non seeded GMP scaffolds in rabbit studies. And no study like this has been designed in humans and certainly would never be powered to produce that same outcome. So this is the only study that stands to make any kind of claim to the race for the surface. So implant-centered infection then has many interactive factors that we do not understand. Perioperative bacterial contamination and sourcing, I think, is undervalued, it's underappreciated. No hospital wants to admit that they have contaminated operating rooms. The implant surface chemistry is also a question. There are thousands of different surfaces that are advocated, but if you carefully look, none of them have been powered in vivo experiments. All of them are in vitro studies, and so you get the enormous plethora of surface chemistry claims with bacteria, but always in test tube experiments. And remember, test tubes cannot model infection. The acute foreign body response is a permissive uh, niche to allow bacterial colonization in vivo. And we cannot duplicate the foreign body response in a test tube either. So that this complexity of infection and the complexity of foreign body acute inflammatory responses to implants are two things that must be resolved with full in vivo preclinical and clinical studies. And then this idea that soft tissues outside the implant in the adjacent fascia, in the adjacent muscle, and the adipose tissue, they pro provide then easy places for pathogens to hide. And there's a pathogen reservoir hypothesis that says that you can rid the periosteum, you can rid the bone of infection, but you might not be able to reach pathogen reservoirs in the soft tissue around it. And so when you do a revision surgery, you then debride, but you don't debride sufficiently because you cannot reach into the muscle, fascia, and fat to get these pathogen reservoirs out. So there's no lone actors. These factors all act in synergy together, and so therefore I would argue that all of our colleagues who make implants the strikers, the biomets, the synthes of the world. They have never designed an implant yet that can combine a strategy against all four of these factors. And most of the antimicrobial strategies that my community builds only address one or two. There are no designs that address all four of these, and that's where I think this field needs to go. The added incentive in my country is that now our medical insurance system will no longer reimburse hospitals for what is considered to be a hospital-acquired infection that was readily preventable. So now we're under scrutiny to clean up our infection surveillance teams and provide data in registries on infection to now understand what are the bad actors and how do we clean up the system. All right, so reminder, bacterial adhesion alone is not infection that the bacteria requires an implant surface, the bacteria on the surface do this dance together, and that produces adhesion. But adhesion in a test tube is not implant infection. And my job as editor of the world's leading biomaterials journal is to flush this concept out and to say that, yes, we can show differences in adhesion to many different biomaterials, to stainless steel and to cobalt chrome and to titanium. But in fact, in vivo, this doesn't equate or correlate to anything with infection. So adhesion is often tested, but it is not a sufficient determinant of infection. Infection is persistent adhesion in the presence of host active clearance mechanisms. So here's now just a sampling of all the different types of biomaterials chemistry. We have immobilized vancomycin. We have immobilized chlorhexidine. We even have electroactive coatings that bleed electrons and amps and current from them. 
We have all kinds of tethered antimicrobial silver releasing systems. There are thousands of different coatings put out there. But coatings generally have often only worked in vitro, or if they do work in vivo, they can only work short term. So for example, percutaneous catheters that are implanted for three days or five days, sure, we can show differences with different chemistries. But if we're talking about a total knee implant, or we're talking about you know, spine screws, or any of these inner body cages and things, infection, where it's a long-term 10, 20, 30, 40 year implant, there is nothing in the literature to show that one of these coatings or one of these strategies has any statistical difference versus the bare surface in a long-term in vivo uh, prevention. So what I'm trying to say is that there are complications with our in vitro antimicrobial assays that are very unpredictable when we move them to real use, to the context that you surgeons then uh, commonly work in. And so we recently published a treatise looking at these issues. I don't have time to go through these points here. But suffice it to say that in vitro assays do not correlate with in vivo efficacy, certainly in any clinical context. And we can make dozens and hundreds of PhD theses looking at in vitro aspects of infection, but we really cannot duplicate that infection as it occurs in your hands, in your patients. So what about in vivo? In vivo, my community looks at animal infection models. But animal infection models are challenging. Why? Because we can say, well, I know that in vitro test tube science is not predictive for the surgical suite, so I'll move it into a mouse or a guinea pig or a rabbit or even a sheep. But we oftentimes use healthy young animals, and we use enormous superdosing in order to get these healthy animals to infect, we use superdosing of an orders of magnitude that you will never see in any of your, of your patients. 10 to the ninth bacteria per injection per mouse. I mean, it's an enormous burden. It's clinically unrealistic. And even then, with these enormous burdens, we get low infection rates. These animals are highly resistant to infection, much more resistant than a human being is. And there are many other issues for why then animal models do not duplicate infection. Let me just look at one of them. Part of the problem is our preclinical validation using animal models. The animal model oftentimes is determined by size, cost, and ease of handling, which is why we use mice. It's often complicated by logistical and financial implications. Mice are cheap to operate on. It's the lowest species that is experimentally valid for preliminary ex experiments. It's acceptable to public and ethical perceptions, whereas models like the dog and certainly non-human primates have fallen greatly out of favor, and certainly in Europe, for use in these experiments. And the question is, what is the question being asked? Is it a mechanistic question, or is it a proof of concept question, or is it a dose finding question, or safety and efficacy question? And different models have different utility. So if we look at the distribution, clearly the rat and the mouse have the uh, the lion's share, so to speak, of animal models in orthopedics, and the rabbit then comes in second. If we look at large animal models that might model volumetrics, perfusion, physiology, and anatomy, these large animal models form the minority, and they're always very expensive. The second point is that bone is not always bone. There's huge species differences in bone. It's always terribly undervalued. So that if we look at sheep bone, illustrating all of the range of bone types here in compact bone, including perversian bone here, and endosteal bone, and transitional bone, and woven bone, and we compare that then to the backscattered image for a modern human tibia, the sheep and the human have very, very different types of uh, anatomy and physiology. And if I put the mouse up next to it, it's again orders of magnitude different than the human. So why does the mouse and the rat comprise the largest experimental body for orthopedic research when in fact many of the anatomical, physiological, and microbiological features of rodent bone bear no resemblance to human bone here? And if we look then across the species at the Haversian system diameters, it's easy to see that the human system, Haversian canals, are so much larger than any of the other species that we work with here. And I could go on and on about the differences in bone and how we then equate mouse and rat bone and the infections thereof to humans when, in fact, it's probably not fair.
So the best that in vitro and in vivo animal studies can address is how much microbial adhesion and biofilm formation is actually inhibited, or how much can we delay it, or how much one biomaterial can do this super, superior to another biomaterial, or how many organisms are killed on one biomaterial versus another, or how many tissue cells can engage and grow on different biomaterials, or how the race for the surface between microbial colonization and tissue integration is influenced by surface design. But you'll notice that none of those questions are clinical questions. None of those are surgical questions, and none of them are patient outcomes questions. These are basic science questions, and they're limited by our experimental tools. These assays cannot answer the most important question for you, or the most important question for a funding agency like my National Institutes of Health, or a regulatory body that requires human data to move a product into the clinical realm, the FDA needs to ask something different. What is that question? The FDA will ask, by what percentage is the biomaterial capable of reducing infection against a clinical application in humans? And again, we cannot answer infection in a test tube. We cannot answer infection reliably even in a mouse or a rat because the pathology and the physiology are distinct. So we're stuck here as a community, and this is where I think India can play a role, and I'll get to this in a minute, by funding and regulatory agencies that are trapping our basic research community to answer that question when we cannot. So what's the detail? Let me talk to you then about the second point in translation as I try to come to a close. The, the major problem with translation and medical device research is lack of clinical evidence. The quality of highly cited surgical research over the past 20 years, 62% was judged to be very low or of low quality in an annals of surgery paper in 2009. That means that the clinical evidence that we're provided for research in moving fields forward is weak and it provides inaccurate conclusions. This problem is basically formed in, the, in statistical underpowering of studies because of cost considerations, recruitment considerations, logistics considerations. We often underpower clinical studies. They're poorly designed. They have poor data. And we can therefore not make adequate conclusions about most surgical data in uh, clinical trial studies. So the premise that I'm going to posit and be provocative here is that true validation of infection-resistant biomaterials and coatings required for clinical translation, then, can only be obtained in a human clinical trial. Our in vitro models are inadequate. Our in vitro preclinical animal models are inadequate. So unfortunately, this is often where development of an antimicrobial biomaterial stops, because it requires a clinical study. Well, why should it stop? Because it requires a clinical study. What's the problem with a clinical study? Well, so Darush put this table together that's very interesting. If we look at the infected implant, heart valve, joint prosthesis, oh, let's take the joint prosthesis. Let's say that the baseline infection rate is 2%. It's close. Let's say we want to make it and show that our new technology could make it 1%, so a 50% reduction. That will require a clinical trial of 5,000 people to show that a 2% rate can be reduced to 1% rate. Statistical powering required by the FDA says that we need 5,000 patients. And not only do we need 5,000 patients, but we have to follow them longitudinally out at least five years. So you have to track dropouts, then other non-recruitment issues. And so therefore, this 5,000 number becomes much larger. And so just to track 5,000 people in a clinical trial, that trial will cost you at least $50 million to make this point that you can cut the infection rate in half. And so to run a study for $50 million is no trivial matter. And most companies that need to take this technology forward to get it into your hands as surgeons, most companies are unwilling to run a trial for 5,000 uh, patients for, to, to produce that risk of maybe receiving that benefit at the end of the clinical trial. And if we try to go to a 25% reduction, the trial size is even more daunting. So the less impressive we want to make our results, the more powered it is with an absolutely un, unbelievable uh, high number of patients for recruits. So that these trials are never conducted, and therefore new technologies, really paradigm-shifting new technologies, are not clinically validated or introduced 
Therefore, there's no innovation in this field. We eke forward incrementally because that's the safest way to make a new product is to step marginally off the previous product. So the result is then, by setting the vice approval bar very high, the physician and the surgeon is forced to fabricate their own solutions. And so this is where we get into trouble, because the only cases of systemic toxicity that you can find published in the literature from antimicrobial solutions released from implants, the only adverse events reporting comes from surgeon homebrew intraoperative systems where they could not get a solution clinically marketed. They could not buy something from Depew Synthes. So they made it themselves as a standard of care procedure off-label, and therefore these toxicity issues come because surgeons like you have no other choice because companies cannot take products to clinical trials because it's too expensive. So I'm going to skip through here because I'm over time. Uh, and come to two case studies. So here as I close, the gentamicin coated tibial nail, I would argue represents one of the closest things to innovation in antimicrobial device. So here we take a clinical tibial nail, I would argue has at least 30 years of clinical use as a titanium product, as a stainless steel product. We take then gentamicin sulfate as an antibiotic that has 40 years of clinical use in orthopedics. We take poly L lactide, which has 40 years of use as a suture material and several other uh, pharmaceutical materials. So we take those three, we mix them together, collectively over 100 years of clinical use of those three biomaterials collectively, and we put them together on the same platform, and the FDA demands a $50 million clinical trial for that piece of equipment that will never generate $50 million in revenues in the next 30 years. So what does Synthes do is they go through all the preclinical work. The FDA demands a $50 million clinical trial, and this product is now no longer on the market, no longer manufactured, because there's nothing in it for Synthes to take this forward. Last example, the antibiotic releasing degradable plate sleeve. This is recently published in a Depew Synthes preclinical study in sheep, where they take a, a Synthes uh, plate and now put a biodegradable polymer sleeve containing gentamicin on that. These are cut, cuttable to length. They can be tailored to any plate you want. Again, plates with 40 years of history, polymer with 40 years of history, gentamicin with 40 years of history, and they will not take this to market because the clinical trial is too expensive. So we see the problem is that the lack of translation from my community to yours is in some degree scientifically problematic. But when we say, all right, then, let's pro prove this in a clinical trial, we see that the companies can no longer help you to get a new product to market because this approach is far too risky and far too expensive. And that's where we are. So I'm going to skip this. So in summary, then, biofilms on biomedical device surfaces occupy a host niche that is immune compromised by the foreign body response. The biofilms can exist on device surfaces because they're contaminated perioperatively. Experimental methods to study this are problematic. They don't translate well in vivo. This adhesion assay, the animal assays are problematic, as I've discussed. Infections don't exist in a flow cell. Infections don't exist in a microchip assay. Infections don't exist in a test tube. They only exist in the presence of competent human uh, uh, mammalian tissue. And despite technology, infection rates on devices have not really changed in decades. And that's probably because technology has not really changed that much in decades to fight infection. And orthopedic device innovation then that translates is stymied by the risk-benefit analysis of running a clinical trial and recovering the costs of that trial in the face of risk of getting it to market. So with those messages, I would be happy to discuss any of these issues. I'm very passionate about trying to get new technologies to market into surgeons' hands, and I'm constantly arguing with our regulatory agencies and our IRB panels about how to run these studies so that we can move technology forward innovation-wise and not have it hindered by the uh, factors that I've discussed with you today. So that I'm very thankful. I'm very proud to be the KT Delacchia medallion holder today. And I appreciate your audience and the opportunity to come address you today.